What's going on YouTube? I'm Pokemon Challenges. I'm probably the best Nuzlocker in the world. And today we're doing another installment of a new series on this channel where we go over Nuzlocke fundamentals, Nuzlocke basics so you guys can learn more. Today we're going to go over my preferred Nuzlocke rule set. Everything that I do in my Nuzlocks, all the rulings that I do. I'm not saying you should use them. I'm saying this is what I do. This is what I prefer. This is what I've found over thousands of hours of experience in Nuzlocking to be the most fun rule set for Pokemon. So let's get into it. Before we do, though, uh, only um, uh, a blah, blah, blah percent of Pokemon <laughs> challenges viewers are subscribed to my channel. So if you'd like to be part of the blah, blah, blah percent that is actually subscribed, make sure that you're actually subscribed because my videos are being recommended to you all the time, but you actually just haven't subscribed yet, so go scroll down and click the button. Make sure you're subscribed. So for this video, a very long time ago, I actually uh, wrote down my the, the rules to my Nuzlocke, as I call them, the hardcore Nuzlocke, into like a little rule book document that I think, looking back now, it's a little cringy, you know, but we're still going to go through it because I think it covers most of the questions that you probably have about my rule set if you're a regular viewer. And if you're a new viewer, it should introduce you to the concept of hard hardcore Nuzlocking extremely well. Let's get into it. So I'm going to read through each section and then I'm going to explain my reasoning behind everything. Generally, I guess if you're completely new, the general, for, for, for general Nuzlocking, the rules that are always accepted are um, if a Pokemon faints, it's dead, and you can only catch the first Pokemon that you encounter on every route. Um, and then most people play with you have to nickname all of your Pokemon, but that's not important at all, in my opinion, because um, it doesn't change anything about gameplay. I'm going to be going into excruciating detail about all these rules and all the little conditions that can happen and all the things so that all those open questions that you guys always send me about little things in my rules should be answered more or less here. If they're not, make sure to go uh, ask in the comments. If I missed anything, I will make sure to not read any of those comments and not respond to any of them. Official Hardcore Nuzlocke Rulebook by Pokemon Challenges. Introduction and disclaimer. This is the rule set I personally use in my Hardcore Nuzlocke's that I do on my stream at twitch.tv slash Pokemon Challenges. To me, this represents the perfect balance of challenge and fun of random and skill elements. This is in no way the be-all end-all of challenge runs and there are definitely some downsides to this rule set. It requires a lot of experience as a Nuzlocker and I do not recommend using this rule set as your very first Nuzlocke challenge. Additionally, this rule set usually requires quite a lot of grinding before gym battles. However, I still believe them to be the baseline for one of the most fun ways ever to play a Pokemon game and I hope you give it a try. All credit for coming up with the original Nuzlocke challenge goes to its creator. Check out his comic here. All right. I, I, I guess just to throw, throw this out there real quick, th this is not like, I don't think you should be playing this way. This is just what I think is the most fun to play with. Um, I think you should play whatever you think is the most fun to play with for you. So any deviation rules from this um, should come out of the sole motivation that you think it would be more fun to play that way. This is pretty out. A lot of things are going to be outdated. I'm going to correct a lot of things, but most things in here are generally true and should answer a lot of the edge cases that come up a lot of the times. Uh, one thing worth noting uh, that, that has changed since I've made this document is I've pretty much phased grinding out of my content completely because there is uh, the, the thing about grinding before gym battles and everything in there. From now on, I will probably only be doing like rare candies and then just level up and then just stay within the level cap and just removing EVs from the game. I think that's a way more fun way to play. But some people like grinding. Some people don't like rare candies. It's all up to you. Let's go into it. The most important thing, obviously, about Nuzlocke is your encounters, that you can only catch the first Pokemon every route. This is um, defined as the following in my, in my rulebook. <clears throat> encounters, 1.1. Basic rules of obtaining Pokemon. Only the first Pokemon I encounter in a specific area may be caught. The area a Pokemon was caught in is defined by the met on text in its summary. This is really important. This is the most important thing about this, okay? This, the met on text in its summary, when you click on its summary. This will answer 99% of questions about whether or not you can get a certain Pokemon, what a certain Pokemon counts as for the encounter. Just look at the met on text and see it, what area, if it was encountered in, if that was the first encounter in that area, that Pokemon is your encounter. 
Pokemon that hatch from an egg are considered an exception to this. The area that the egg is received in is counted as the area the Pokemon is encountered in. This is actually something that I've changed very recently about my runs. I don't do this anymore. From now on, I'll be doing where the egg is hatched. It's more consistent with the above rule. There's no edge cases where it really matters, other than sometimes you get an additional encounter, which is fine. I just think it's more consistent to do egg hatching instead of egg receiving. If the first encounter in an area is killed off in battle, the encounter may not be re-rolled. A re-roll is considered another chance at an encounter while ignoring and not catching the previous one. So yeah, if you kill the first encounter, then you get, obviously you're not catching another one. These rules apply as soon as I am first able to encounter and catch a Pokemon. For example, Pokemon I encounter in Tallgrass before I'm able to receive Pokeballs do not count as my first encounter of the route. Should be pretty obvious too, if you don't have Pokeballs, it doesn't count. So once you get those Pokeballs, you can start catching Pokemon, you can start encountering them. Pretty obvious. 1.2. Methods of encountering Pokemon. I may choose the method of acquiring the encounter freely. Fishing, surfing, grass, hordes, rock smash, honey, headbutt, etc. are all considered legitimate. The exception to this are Dex Nav, Shaking Grass, and Pokemon obtained in an SOS chain started on the first legal encounter of the route. All equivalents thereof. I mean, the SOS chain thing is pretty obvious, right? Because that's not actually your first encounter. Um, Dex Nav is pretty OP. I don't do Shaking Grass just because Shaking Grass makes every route so damn consistent. It's a little bit weird. Um, you could do Shaking Grass, it doesn't really matter. A gift Pokemon is considered a legitimate encounter and will be treated as such. It may not, I may not encounter another Pokemon after receiving one as a gift. That should be pretty obvious too. That's like one of the big ones and one of the first like rule dis disputes that you're going to see or rule differences that you're going to see between di different runs. Some people catch a Pokemon on the route that they receive their starter on because in a lot of Pokemon games, that route is where you meet that Pokemon. It's what it says in its stats. For example, in Gen 3, Pokemon Emerald, it'll say in the stats of your Torchic, met on Route 101. So you do not get a Route 101 encounter after you get that gift Pokemon. Moving on. Manipulating encounters. I may freely choose my starter or any other gift Pokemon that has multiple options, like the casino, etc. If the first encounter on a route is a double battle or horde encounter, the Pokemon I can catch in that battle may be chosen by me. I've just personally done it this way because I think it's more fun to choose in situations like that. Repelling in an area to get a certain encounter, high level, different floor, roaming, or static encounter is allowed. So th there's a specific repel trick you can do where like some Pokemon that you encounter on a route are only encountered at a certain level. Um, so let's say for example, let's say a route has level 15 Rotatas and level 16 Arceuses that you can encounter, right? If you were to repel on that route leading with a level 16 Pokemon, you would only be able to encounter that Arceus because the repels would get rid of everything below that Pokemon's level, so level 15 Rotatas. That would be a way of manipulating your encounter. In the past, I've allowed this. I think it's kind of game dependent because in some games, the repel manipulating is pretty extreme. But I think most of the times, this should be like a, a legitimate encounter. And then obviously repelling to get through grass so you can get to a pond so you can fish there is another way of doing this, right? Additional and illegitimate encounters. Trading with NPCs is allowed and not considered an encounter. I may trade with NPCs in areas that I've previously received an encounter on or, pl or plan to receive an encounter on. This is just because you give up an encounter to get another one, and I think trading is cool. I think it should be part of the game. I think it encourages trading. I think it makes it more interesting. If I, at any point, encounter a shiny Pokemon during the run, I may catch but not use that Pokemon. If the first encounter on a route is a shiny, I do not get an additional encounter. I explain my reasoning for the shiny for this rule in this clip. Um, what I mean by that is just I get to catch the Pokemon, have it in my box, but not actually use it. The re a lot of people play with shiny claws, so if you get a shiny, you can catch it, because that's cool. People like using shinies. I just don't, because in a I've had runs where grinding for a shiny as an additional encounter was a legitimate option. And I hated that. I hated the fact that that was a legitimate option. Now you could just say, hey, just outrule grinding for shinies to get it as an encounter. But the thing is, how do you consistently outrule that? Because there's also decisions that you could be making that could be leading to you potentially getting more shinies, getting more encounters. Um, that would be then considered optimal, right? For example, do you never repel in grass? Because you increase your, the likelihood of you getting a shiny. That would be considered optimal, but that's not fun. That's not cool, right? So some, some raw mics also have ridiculous shiny raids. So yeah, I've just decided to eliminate shiny claws for my runs because it makes optimal plays weird is basically what it is, right? My rules are always gonna be optimized for, I want my optimal plays to be fun, if that makes sense, right? Moving on, 
I may not use two Pokemon of the same species or evolution line. This is known as Dupes Clause. If the first encounter of a route belongs to an evolution line of a Pokemon that I may already have, sorry, of a Pokemon that I have already received as an encounter in that run, the encounter on that route may be re-rolled until I encounter a Pokemon that I may use. So this is, this is just Dupes Clause, but you obviously caught a Poochyana on Route 102. You encounter a Poochyana on Route 103. You may not catch that Poochyana. You have to re-roll for another Pokemon, right? Some people play with optional Dupes Clause where you can re-roll it. I think that's stupid because that means you can just catch Infinite Gyarados in a lot of games. And then I go by evolution line. So if you catch a Flareon, you may not catch an Umbreon or an Eevee later on. Th I think those are pretty important um, about that for how I play with dupes claws. And then obviously if a route has only dupes, I may not catch any Pokemon on that route because there's just no non-duplicate Pokemon on it. It's, it's good that I have you guys in chat here. Also, if a Pokemon dies, it, it still counts as dupe, dupes claws. So if your Gyarados dies, you can still not catch a Magikarp afterwards. It's for the rest of the run is how I play it. I may decide to ban usage of certain Pokemon depending on the game I'm currently playing. For example, Blissey and Salamence are Pokemon I will usually not use as they make gameplay too easy for my taste. Pretty obvious exception here already is I use Salamence and Emerald Kaizo because Emerald Kaizo is balanced around Salamence more or less, right? It's just very, very game dependent. I think the two big non-legendaries that are worth noting here that I usually don't use are Blissey and Shedinja because I think they make runs really boring. However, a Pokemon of the same evolution line as a banned Pokemon will count as my encounter. I may use it, e.g. I may catch a Shellgon, but not evolve it to Salamence. General rule of thumb, this ban list is giga old, doesn't matter. Losing Pokemon. Um, this is the second big section of this. This is basically Pokemon dying. Basic conditions for death. If at any point the HP of one of my Pokemon is reduced to zero, that Pokemon is considered dead and may no longer be used. I must permanently put the Pokemon into the PC as soon as possible. HM Mules and Forced Receiving. If I need to use a certain HM to, pro to uh, progress in the game and none of my alive Pokemon are able to learn it, I may pick up a dead Pokemon from the PC for the sole purpose of using that HM with it. This does not include moves like Flash, Thief for stealing items, or using Sweet Scent for hordes. An exception may be made for HM Fly as it raises the quality of the content I make. Also, oh, did I say receiving? I meant reviving. Sorry. <laughs> I don't know why I said forced receiving. If you have no, but this is important, right? If you have no other Pokemon that can learn that HM and you need to progress, then you may teach that HM to an H HM mule and put it on your team. However, only in that case, right? Because the, you, you, otherwise you still need to manage your move slots, right? If the only Pokemon that can learn that goddamn Rock Smash, it, Rock Smash HM on your team is your Salamence and you really want to keep all those moves, tough luck, you're going to have to replace one of those moves with Rock Smash. At least in my rule set. Um, and then for fly, I, I, it's really annoying to walk around if you don't have a Flymon. Um, so I think flying around on a dead Pokemon is, is fine. I may catch an additional HM mule if I have no Pokemon dead or alive that can help me pro progress. If I end up in a situation where a dead Pokemon or an HM mule is put into battle, this could happen via roar or whatever, right? I must switch into a living Pokemon immediately. I may not use the moves Assist or Beat Up or any mechanically similar moves while I have a revived Pokemon or HM Mule on my team. Also pretty obvious, right? Level Caps. This is a pretty big part of my runs because I think in most situations the optimal play is just to overlevel the opponent and just grind more. I think that's stupid, so I'd put Level Caps on my runs. Here's how they work. Basic Rules for Level Caps. Any Pokemon I use for battle may not exceed the gym leader's highest leveled Pokemon in level. This applies exactly until the gym battle is initiated, so overleveling during a gym fight is allowed. Right? Makes sense. Um, if the first gym leader's highest level Pokemon is a level 16 Mon, your Mons can't go over level 16. Pretty basic stuff. The level cap for the Elite Four is to be determined by me. A good starting point is the last Elite Four member's highest level Pokemon. This is usually what I go by. So Lucian or uh, Lance or uh, what's her name? Karen or whatever. The level cap is in effect until I initiate the first Elite Four battle. I may not use any rare candies after initiating the Elite Four gauntlet. The reason I like last Elite Four member is you gain a little bit of XP throughout the Elite Four and the champion is usually a little bit higher than the last um 
than the last Elite Four member, so you're you're probably not going to be over leveling the champion, but you're still going to be pretty fairly leveled. I think that's I, I think that's a generally good rule. The rare candy thing is obvious too. I I assume exceeding the level cap. If a Pokemon does overlevel under any other circumstances not specified above, or I catch an overleveled Pokemon, it is considered dead until I beat the gym that unlocks its level. I think that makes sense. That's a question that I get a lot. A Pokemon that exceeds its level cap during battle or is brought out into battle through Roar, Whirlwind, Dragon Tail, etc. must be switched out immediately. I may not use the moves, assist, or beat up. Same thing, right? If at any point all my Pokemon are above the level cap, the run is considered a wipe and I must restart. What if a re revived Pokemon HM Mule it has Intimidate in a sent into battle? Tough luck. That's just gonna happen. Oh, I guess something worth mentioning is that the, my level caps are also flexible for some ROMs. Like for Blue and Emerald Kaizo, I raised the level cap by one level for the first two gym leaders just to make the early game more consistent because it, it would have been too annoying to beat otherwise. I'm obviously, I'm not super 100% on those level caps all the time. If I feel like it makes the experience more fun, more interesting, then um, I usually just raise level caps. Because the alternative in Emerald Kaiser, for example, is to reset for very specific encounters, which I think is way less fun than just raising the level cap by one. Oh, another really weird situation that we've actually been in is if a Pokemon overlevels and it's out against like a Shadow Tag or Arena tra Trap Pokemon. I, honest to God, don't even have a consistent ruling for this. I just kind of play out the Pokemon. Uh, uh, like, because the, you can't switch, right? And you can't reset in that situation. So you can just kind of have to play it out if you're trapped in that situation. Play like normally. There's nothing else you can do. And then just switch as soon as you can. Oh, I do in Rule Breaking. Oh, interesting. So I think I've changed my stance on this. Okay. Items. I may at no point use non-Pokeball items for my bag during a battle. Among others... Sorry. Among others, this includes healing items, battle items, and Pokedolls, but does not apply to items held by my Pokemon. At no point can I have more than one Pokemon on my team hold leftovers. Guys, stop. You guys are so cringe. Wait, what was that article I retweeted this I I was so confused by this I was so confused by this this took me a legit like 15 seconds to understand our brains have been poisoned so yeah I don't use items in my nuzlocks I think items are super super broken and everything that's wrong with with regular nuzlocks probably comes from items healing items are ridiculously broken x items are ridiculously broken a priority move that heals you to full and doesn't cost you a move slot is pretty damn good. Being able to boost the stats of any Pokemon is pretty damn good. It makes any Nuzlocke trivial in my opinion. Banning items is the very first thing you should do to make Nuzlocke an actual real gaming experience in my opinion. If, if you've gotten a little bit more into it and you're like familiar with all the mechanics that go into Pokemon and everything. I, I, I ban all items because they're all broken. And then the leftovers clause it's just a little thing extra. It, it's just, it just kind of results out of the fact that leftovers are usually available in like, you, you can usually like thief them off of wild Pokemon, like wild Munchlax or whatever, and get like an infinite amount of them. And then usually your Pokemon will just hold, all six of your Pokemon will hold leftovers for the rest of the game, which I think is really boring. I like it when there's a little bit more diversity there. So I do the leftovers clause. Um, pretty obvious stuff. Now I used to actually play with throwing Pokeballs in battle being allowed. Because that's you. That sometimes that's a viable strategy. Because for example, if you want to pee pee stall a Wobbuffet. However, I don't actually do that anymore because I think it's lame. So yeah, only Pokeballs when you're catching Pokemon. This is another thing that I get a lot of questions about. This is a lot of thing that people sometimes do differently. This is how I do it though, losing the run. The run is considered lost when I lose a party of Pokemon and enter the white out screen. This applies even if I have other Pokemon left in the PC. The reason I do this is because if you've lost six really good Pokemon for a gym fight, the run is probably over anyway. It, there's probably no point in continuing, and it just makes the battles more high stake too. I think that's cooler. All right, moving on. Settings. This is actually another really important one. The battle style must always be on set. So every Pokemon game has the option to be played on set or shift mode. The difference is that on shift mode, after you KO an opponent's Pokemon, the game will ask you, if you'd like to, it will tell you what the opponent will send in next, and it will ask you if you would want to switch. This is an insane advantage granted to you as the player, because the opponent doesn't have that advantage, obviously. 
The way that Pokemon works pacing wise is when you KO the opponent's Pokemon, they basically get a free turn because they get to send in one of their Pokemon for free, resetting the tempo in their favor, right? Because they ha get to choose. Technically, the AI doesn't get to choose, but because they get to send in a Pokemon without it taking damage, right? Um, it resets the tempo and takes away your advantage as, as, as someone who's ahead, right? The problem is if you take that advantage away from the opponent, you gain so much tempo of the aggressor. Aggressive teams are so, so powerful. The, the, the best way to explain this is in a little bit more technical terms. In Pokemon, there is things known as counters and things known as checks. A counter is a Pokemon that can switch into a Pokemon and then take it out. A check, at least the way that I use the word, means that if the Pokemon is out against the other Pokemon, it will win, right? It has to be out to counter the other Pokemon, basically. This makes sense, right? The problem is if you play on Switch, every check has become a counter because you don't need that additional turn to switch into the opponent. It just shifts the advantage in your favor so much. So I always play on set. I think you should always play on set. I think shift mode is so goddamn easy. The Gen 6 Plus XP share may be turned on or off at any time. A lot of people ask me if I turn off the XP share to make the game harder. I actually think that's weird because you could always, it just means that you have to grind more to get to even level. So if, if you're gonna play with XP restrictions, you need to make them more clear like you do with level caps, right? When playing on an emulator, I may speed up the game at any point. I think that one's also pretty obvious. Crashes and rule breaking. Uh, this section is a little weird. This is very personal to me and has a lot to do with me being a streamer. I don't think any of this is going to apply to you. I'm going to go through it anyway because uh, I'm, I'm interested to see what I what I did with this. It's maybe the rule breaking section is really weird and probably pretty out of date. In case of an emulator or console crash, I must reload the last save and the following rules apply. All encounters I have gotten between the save point and crash are considered lost and may not be re-rolled. Any Pokemon that died between the last save point and crash are still considered dead, and I may re-battle any required trainer battles that I have beaten between save point and crash. I may use any method I see fit to clear this battle, using dead Pokemon, modifying the save, etc. Any Pokemon that faints during such a re-battle is not considered dead. I think this one is... It applies mostly to me as a streamer because um, I need to like hold myself accountable. The problem is obviously, right, if I'm in a battle and my game crashes, I can't restart that battle, right, and make the turns before that not have happened because that would just incentivize me to, to crash my emulator when something goes wrong, right? It gives me an out, right? Because there's no way for you to know if I actually cra if the game actually crashed or if I made it crash in order to rebattle the trainer, right? Does that make sense? The lost encounter part is a little bit extreme. You could probably, if, if you know the IVs of the Pokemon, you could probably just reinstate the Pokemon. Basically loading everything to the point where it was up until that point seems fine. When I wrote this document, I wasn't always doing emulator runs, right? So reinstating the exact same Pokemon that I had before then would have been impossible. PKXing the, the, the encounters that you had back in with the exact same IVs would, for example, be completely fine. These, the, this section is, a, is definitely a relic of the past. <laughs> God damn it. Who was this? Who did it? Of course it was Josh. If at any point I break one of these rules on accident or purpose, the standard punishment is to reload at the last save point and kill off the Pokemon that I might have been saved by said rule violation. If no Pokemon was saved, I will select one at random. I don't know why I added this. That seems kind of whack too. That is my preferred rule set. That is the rule set I usually play with. There's been some other things cropping up recently that I think make a lot of games more interesting that you can play with. I think setup moves are really broken, so banning those could be cool. Um, Encore and Substitute are really broken in a lot of games, so banning those could probably be cool. And then the, the Rare Candy and EV thing that I mentioned are things definitely to play around with. But this is generally the rules I play with. This is my exact rule set. This is why I have these rules as I have them. Most of the time, the reason for having a rule that I have is that it's more fun to play that way. Oh, pinwheel claws. Oh, a lot of people get two encounters in pinwheel forest in gen five for some reason, because it has two sections. I never understood why. It's one area, just two, it has two sections that look different. Dying in multi battles. I mean, that's kind of said here, right? You have to lose all your Pokemon and you have to go to the whiteout screen. Um, I think in some AI, where in some AI partner battles, your partner can still win for you and you don't white out. So that would not be considered a wipe. Oh, sword and shield encounters. <laughs> okay, so in 
in Let's Go and Sword and Shield, I just blindfold myself and then run into the route <laughs> to get a random encounter. You could also just get the encounter that's like the exclamation point pop up in the grass. That's fine too. Um, oh, Wild Area is also answered by the Met At section of the summary because the different parts of the Wild Area all are considered different areas and different routes. If I can give you one thing from this video, it's this. The Met On Text and the Pokemon Summary. If that was your first encounter and what it says in the Pokemon's Met On Text and the Summary, that is your encounter for that area. Safari Zone is one encounter because of exactly that. And make sure if you have any other questions regarding the rule set, put them down in the comments. If you'd like to see more videos in this format, in this series where we go over the Nuzlocke basics with you guys, if there's another thing you'd like me to make a video on regarding this, leave it down in the comments, leave a like, and goodbye. I can do this boys. All right. Uh -uh. What's going on YouTube? <laughs> Perfect. Just take that. There you go. That's the intro. That's the intro. What's going on YouTube? I'm Pokemon Challenges. I'm probably the best Nuzlocker in the world and I'm not getting a vasectomy because I'm scared of because <laughs> I'm scared of having chronic ball pain. What's going on YouTube? I'm Pokemon Challenge. <laughs> It's so hard. I can't do it. This is the rule set I personally use in my hardcore Nuzlocke. In my, this is the Nuzlocke. See, this is why I hate doing scripted videos, by the way, because this always happens.